Hi, and welcome to MSC. In today's lesson, we're going to talk about processing lab data in Excel. So, as you can see here, I have an Excel file open with a little bit of mock data. And in this data, I have a temperature column, and it looks like I've started creating some volume data. Again, this is just completely mock data to work with in this example. Perhaps this is some type of gas law data or something of the sort. A couple of things I wanted to show you was as we build headings across, Excel will actually do a pretty good job if you click on the corner and have it be the plus symbol, not the large plus, but the small one, you can actually cause it to fill and it senses the pattern and the AI and the system is good enough to start filling in for you different things, which can be super handy. And we're going to see a lot of the fill functions as we go through this lesson. Also, you might note that I don't have super creative headings here. This is really, in my opinion, your Excel file is just your working document. And as a teacher, I'm not as concerned about the polish of the Excel file as I am with the Word file at the end of the day. So for me, working in Excel, I can take some shortcuts with some of my headings and stuff. It's my document to work with and I'll polish it or I hope that the students will polish it when they bring it into Word. Such things in the headings would be like units, um, as I've shown in brackets here, although you can also show that as a division, a slash, and the unit to divide the units out of the column, as well as reading error or any other error values that would be appropriate to apply. Perhaps a propagated error would be in the heading of the columns as well. As you can see here, we have five different temperatures uh, for our independent X variable, five different iterations that we've done here and collected some volume data. This is again, all pretend, but we're gonna be able to use this to create some graphs, which will be great. We have done five trials of the volume, which is a typical goal for many high school labs to have five iterations and five trials. Now, very rarely are we ever interested in graphing any of the individual trials. We're typically only interested in an average. So I'm going to label this column average Again, Excel is mostly for the user, I feel, and you'd want to polish that with units and whatnot in your Word file when you copy information over to Word. In Excel, there are many shortcuts. I will show you a few here. The first one I'll show you is the average. So anytime you're typing an equation in Excel, you're gonna hit equals, and then we'll start typing the word average. And we can see that average pops up. If we double click on it, now it has the word average with an open bracket and we can highlight the data we want to put in. So we want to average our five trials for the first iteration of temperature at negative 10 degrees Celsius. I then want to close the bracket and hit enter. And so there's my average data there. Now I can repeat that process all the way down or I can simply go to the corner where I get that plus sign, the small black plus sign, and I can drag it down and it will fill down for me. And we can look here, I have the equation bar, so you can see that the average here is from B2 to F2, and down here you can see, well, it's B6 to F6. So that worked well. Not only can you fill down in Excel, but you can fill left or fill right, fill up. When I did the volume piece, I filled to the right. So this is probably what we're going to want to graph, is our temperature data, our independent X data, versus our average dependent Y data. So to insert a graph, we will click on insert at the top, and then we'll choose from our chart selection. This might be a drop down menu for you. We want to choose this scatter plot. That's just the dots. Okay, very rarely do we want to connect the dots. Here, we will create a trend line a little bit later in this video. So we'll click Scatter. As you can see, it selected all my data and tried to create a graph for me. At different times, this has given me different results on what it selected. What I really want, though, is the temperature, the X, 
and my average volume, which is my Y. So let's go in and get rid of this. And I like to get rid of it, even if it did a good job of trying to get what the data I want, I want to make sure, for sure, that it's collected the data that I want on the graph. On the graph. So we're going to say, select data. And all these ones here, I'm going to remove. And if you look, as I remove them, you can see them disappear, I think. Remove, 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 remove. Excellent. So everything's been blown away. All I have is a blank canvas there for my graph. We're now going to click Add. And you can add a series name here if you'd like. I typically go straight for the X values and worry about labeling axes and everything later. So we go here and now we're able to highlight the cells that I would like my X axis to be. And then I click here and that will put it in. So that's my X axis. It's already started to try to do something here for me, which is great. I'm then going to repeat for my Y values and I'm going to highlight my Y values. I'm highlighting my average data. Again, very rarely are we ever interested in graphing any individual trial. And I'll put that in and I will say, okay. And I will say, okay. And so here's my graph. Again, this is fictitious data. I made it to be more or less linear. And there you can see we have graphed some data. What's great here is I'm able to maneuver things fairly well in Excel. And if I realized that I had the wrong column, I could shift it to a different column and my data will adjust, which is great. Oh, and if I click off it like this, I can click back on my data and shift it back over to where I want it. Excellent. So now I have my data graphed. I have my horizontal X axis being my temperature and I have my vertical Y being this average volume. Now, as you can see, I can click on the chart title and I can put in whatever title I would like to put, whatever I feel is a good title of the graph. When I'm dealing with graph and wanting to change some graph features, I can click on things that are visible for me or if I'm trying to figure out how to access graph menus, I can click on the graph and everything should be contained in either chart design or format. Format seems to be mostly size and kind of how it looks with colors. Chart design is some of the more features you'd like, adding more data, flip-flopping rows and columns, for example. A lot of what we're gonna to want to work with will be under the far left under add chart element. So if we click on this, we can see there's a lot of different examples of things we could do. Let's look at axis titles and we could go and now add a primary horizontal axis. We could go and we could label it whatever our independent variable was. In this case, it's temperature, but we could label whatever it is and we can put add the units and the error associated with that axis as well. And we could repeat this for the vertical one as well, and we could change that title around. The legend here is also accessible. As you can see, I have a legend listed at the bottom. I can move that wherever I'd like it. I think with only one data set, I don't need a legend at all. So I can either delete it by going through this menu part, or I believe if I click on it itself and just hit delete, I can just get rid of it that way. And if I'm like, oh no, I want it back, then I can just go through add chart element again. If you're ever stuck and you're like, there's no add chart element, I can't change my graph, click on it. And again, chart design, and then over to add chart element. So at this stage, we've dealt with our titles. Again, don't forget to put in the titles, the units themselves. So this would be degrees Celsius, as well as the plus or minus value. Maybe it's plus or minus 0.5 degrees, for example. And now that we've done that work, we have a couple of options. We can now either try to add a line of best fit or put our error bars on this graph. We haven't created the data yet for the error bars. So let's start with the line of best fit. Again, I click on my graph, Go add chart design or to add chart element 
And now we're going to look down here at trend line. Now we can go straight to linear from here and you can see it immediately pops up and you can see the different options. I like to always go to add uh, more trend line options. And again, we're allowed to pick linear. If you want other ones, you can work with them. You can see how that's all laid out if you wanna click through at some point. You can forecast it backwards and forwards if you wanna extrapolate further out or further back, which is sometimes needed. You could set an intercept if you wanted to, if you knew it was a fixed value. I personally like to see in my students that they display the equation on the chart and that they display the R squared value on the chart. So those are the things I'm looking for. So we've added a linear, and because we've gone to more trend line options, I'm able to select both of those. So I'll close out of this window, and now you can see that we have the equation of the line of best fit and the R squared value there, and I can move it around and position it just exactly where I want it. And if I want to label it because I have multiple things going on, I can say best fit line, and that way that's clear. I also could, if I wanted to, go back and color code different things using um, other tools in Excel to make sure that everything matches color-wise to make things clear. So trend lines, super powerful. Adding the equation is very, very important in my opinion. And the R squared value, how accurate of a fit is it, I think is a useful piece to discuss as well in labs. So now we're going to look at adding error bars. So in order to add error bars, and there are some built-in features in Excel, but I'm a big proponent of generating our own error bars based on our data. So this could be a reading error. It could be, in this case, I'm going to show you how to do a standard deviation, which I think is an excellent way of doing an error in an average value. It could be a propagated error. If there's multiple ways of calculating an error on a value, I think we should always use the largest one that's associated with the number. Let's look here at calculating a standard deviation for each of our trials. So again, I'm gonna start by writing standard deviation. Notice that spread out over another cell. I can auto size it by going up to the border between the two cells and double clicking. It'll auto size. Awesome, I'm gonna enter a formula so I hit equals. The short form for standard deviation in Excel is STDEV, and you can see a bunch of them pop up. I imagine for your data, probably the STDEV.P will be the one you'd like to use. Double click. And just like before, we're highlighting. Remember for the average, we highlighted. So we're highlighting. You can also type the range in if you'd like using a colon in between. We're gonna highlight and we're not gonna highlight the average because it's not included in the standard deviation. Then we'll close the bracket and hit enter. Then we will scroll, or sorry, rather fill that down. And there's all my standard deviations. Now standard deviations are typically an error value and most error values will probably be only scored to one significant figure, especially at a high school level in terms of precision. But in an Excel file, again, in my opinion, it's fine to leave them as a big decimal and work with them like that. And then when you transport them into Word is where you can deal with place values and significant figures and do that type of work in Word in the charts that you create there. So now we have to tell Excel that I want to use these standard deviations as my error bars. As I said before, I think it's best to use the largest error associated with the value. So if I had a different error, the propagated error perhaps on some calculation that was bigger than my standard deviation, then I would create a new column where I'd list out which errors I'd like to use and I'd use that column to generate my error bars, always using the largest area associated with the number. So if I'm trying to generate something with a chart, I'm gonna have the chart, I'm gonna go chart design over to add chart element. Error bars are here. Again, there's some options that come built in. As you can see, some of them look a little bit different. I don't know why sometimes it doesn't give you the option right away, more error bar option. I'm not sure why it does that sometimes. What I have found works typically, we'll see if it does here for me, is click away, click away from the graph. Click back on the graph, chart design, add chart element, error bars, and now I have more error bar options. 
And I've had that happen to me several times. Not sure why. Maybe somebody knows why and they can put a comment in the comments below this video. So we're gonna click on more error bar options, just like we did for the trend lines. This is where I get to choose if it's both a plus and minus, which it is. We're gonna be able to choose the cap style. I like having the horizontal bar on the cap or vertical bar if it's a horizontal uh, error bar. Here it has a fixed value. That's great. I can choose all those other ones that I could initially choose from that first drop down window. I'm gonna go custom and I'm gonna say specify value. And so just like when we selected our X and Y data, we can now select the standard deviation. Now, most high school labs, I imagine, are probably going to have the same plus data as minus data. But notice I could have a different plus range in my error than the negative range, which is a cool feature as well. So we're going to click here. We're going to select this data. That's my error bars in the plus direction. And that is also my error bars in the negative direction. And I'm going to input that here and I'm going to say OK. And there it should have done that for me. So let's go take a look at the graph. And we can see, yeah, that looks like the biggest error and it looks like the biggest error bar. And you can always double check too. Uh, if I realized, oh no, wait, this error here, something went wrong with that whole iteration and I actually have an error of five. And I hit enter. And you can see it changed it right there for me in real time, which is really cool. So that's great. It also, I'll click undo on that. It also allows me if I'm like, oh no, I wrote this number down wrong. It should be 23. It adjusts everything in real time for me. So I don't have to agonize about redoing all my calculations. Again, I'll undo that change for now. Although it made the standard deviation too, which was just a happy coincidence. So here we have done the vertical error bars. Now we can click on the horizontal error bars, which it should have auto populated for you. And I believe if we can find one I can click on, then we double click and it should bring up the horizontal error bars. Clicking on the error bar itself is a little fiddly and you might even have to zoom in a little bit depending on the scale of your graph to see it. Again, my temperature values here, plus or minus half a degree is probably the reading error on the thermometer unless it's a digital one and so I'll change my fixed value to 0.5 and that will be all the way across for all my temperature values for the range the error that I have so we can see that our error bars have shrunk back down in the horizontal axis which is great and we have our plus minus listed here Sometimes they'll shrink down to the size where you can't see them very well, in which case my advice for students is always to still go through the process and then comment on it in the caption that they are there. The size is indicated, but they're just not visible on the graph itself. So now we have a graph that is more or less put together. Obviously, we need to polish some of our titles and maybe choose different locations for a label. But this is a graph that is ready to potentially put into Excel, depending what other type of error analysis would like to do to this. And we'll be able to present this as a good, indic a good indicator of our data of temperature versus average volume in this scenario. As always, I hope this video has been helpful to you. Thank you so much for watching and thank you for listening.